Hello and welcome, I'm Logan Jacobson and I'll be doing part one of this presentation today. We'll be going over estimating the wavelength of emitted microwaves. This was a lab that we did at Colorado Mesa University in the spring of 2020. My partner Calvin Baver will be going over the second part of this presentation. In this presentation, I'll be going over what is microwave radiation, how the wavelengths of radiation are measured. I'll then go into an introduction of the standing wave experiment that we did, and then I'll go into the procedure, the results, the conclusion, and I will present some error. Calvin Baffer will go over an alternative to this experiment that we did as well. He'll be going over this in part two of this presentation. First, we're going to go over what is microwave radiation. Microwaves are a form of non-ionizing electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation propagates from oscillating electric and magnetic fields. On this figure, you'll see in this vertical axis, we'll have the electric field. In this horizontal axis, we'll have the magnetic. Oscillating electric fields cause magnetic fields, and vice versa. These are consequences of fundamental laws of electromagnetism. The direction that this wave propagates is dependent on the direction of the changing magnetic and electric fields. Electromagnetic waves propagate at the speed of light, c equals c times 10 to the 8 meters a second. Electromagnetic radiation is often characterized by its wavelength. Its wavelength, as you could see here, is the distance from peak to peak of either an electric field or a magnetic field. This wavelength can be related to its frequency by wavelength equals c, the speed of light, over the frequency. Or you could also have the frequency is equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength. In different circumstances, it is more optimal to either use wavelength or frequency. For the means of this presentation, we're often going to use the wavelength. In this presentation, we're going to be using the wavelength of microwaves, and the wavelength of microwaves is proportional to 10 to the minus 2 meters or centimeters. To give an example of microwave radiation, we're going to talk about microwave ovens in your kitchen. Microwave radiation is used to cook your food. In a microwave oven, a microwave hits a water molecule. The polar water molecule tries to align itself with the field of the wave. Due to the oscillatory nature of the microwave, the water molecule will have to keep moving to align itself. This movement is frictionful, and the friction creates heat. This figure depicts a water molecule going through a microwave section. A water molecule, H2O, contains one oxygen, O, which is charged 2 minus, and 2 hydrogens, each charged positive 1. If we look at the structure of the water molecule, we will see that water has a positively charged side and a more negatively charged side. This is what makes the water molecule polar. The poles of this water molecule are what try to align itself with the electric field from the microwave. Now we're going to talk about why does the wavelength matter? An electromagnetic radiation's wavelength defines its function. From the chart here, you can see that radio waves are generally large waves. Microwaves are just smaller than radio waves, and you can get all the way down to gamma rays, which are really tiny. Car stereos are sensitive to very small changes in wavelength of the radio wave that you are tuned into. Very subtle differences in wavelength can mean the difference between classic rock and pop music. Very subtle differences in microwave wavelengths are used in cancer treatments, spacecraft communications, and all sorts of different applications. It's very important to know which wavelength you are dealing with. Now we're going to attempt to measure the wavelength using a standing wave. Standing waves form when low amplitude waves in which are traveling in both directions interfere and have fixed phase relationships. Here we have a standing wave represented with a string between two fixed barriers. We can imagine one wave traveling this way and the other wave traveling this way. The distance they travel can be called r. Each one of these waves, we can label them like this, 
travels one wavelength within this configuration. Within this standing wave frame, we've traveled the distance r, and we know that the strings each traveled one wavelength. So this distance r is equal to two times the wavelength. We can call each section of the standing wave one wavelength here. If we were to add a third wavelength, then this distance r would just equal three wavelengths. This means that r is equal to an integer number n times wavelength. If we were to track the nodes of only one of the strings, so each, say this is the string here, and we wanted to track this right here, we would say that this distance r is equal to n over 2 wavelength because it's halfway between one of the wavelengths for one of the strings. This relation will later on be used to help determine the wavelength of an incident microwave. To measure a wavelength using a standing wave, you first have to make a standing wave. We're going to need a source of the microwave. We'll call this the source, S. It'll be plugged in. It'll give us our microwaves. We also need something to receive the microwaves. We'll call this the receiver. And on this receiver, we'll have a detector that'll tell us the magnitude of the microwave that's incoming. These will be 180 degrees away from each other and of measurable distance. The detector is able to detect the amplitude of the wavelength at the point of the detector. If the detector measures a wave here or here, it'll get the same value. This is because the amplitude of the wave squared is proportional to the intensity of the wave at that point. And if we measured it here, we'll get a value of zero, which will be a minimum point. We'll be able to create a standing wave between the source and the detector and receiver because the receiver doesn't only absorb the radiation, but it also reflects it back. When the detector detects a value of zero or its minimum point, we know that we are at a standing wave. You can imagine the source setting a microwave such like this and then bouncing off here at the receiver and coming back this way. This is almost like the diagram we saw on the last frame. You can see that multiple wavelengths can exist within this distance r. We have now created a good setup to start the standing wave experiment. We are given a source which emits 2.84 centimeter wavelengths of microwave radiation. Our goal in this experiment is to either reject or confirm the given wavelength of this radiation. Now that we have our standing wave created from the last slide, we can adjust the distance between the receiver and the emitter such that we go from one node to another. This delta r relationship comes from a couple of slides ago when we were talking about the relationship between the distance and the wavelength with the number of nodes in our standing wave. We can rearrange it to solve and find for the relation for our wavelength. If we only move back one node, then our delta n is just equal to 1, so our wavelength will be equal to 2 times the distance that we moved to get to that node. So in summary, we're going to have our box here, which is going to be our source, and our box here, which is going to be our receiver. They're going to be split apart a distance r such that this distance r gives a value of our detector equal to zero so we know we're on a node and have a standing wave. We then move our receiver back such that it starts at this zero term and goes back until it's at zero again. This distance that we moved it back will be our delta r and our delta n will just be one the whole time because we only moved it back one node. So, we'll be able to get our wavelength using this equation. After running four trials of this experiment, 
we found that our wavelength is equal to 2.8 plus or minus 0.1 centimeters. If you recall from a couple of slides ago, the manufacturer, the known wavelength that was given to us of this electromagnetic radiation was 2.84 centimeters. Thus, the known wavelength falls within our data set. Although this value fell within our data range that we found experimentally, our range is rather large. Measuring the change in distance was only as accurate as the meter stick we could measure with, some inherent error. The meter stick is only accurate to 0.1 centimeters. This 0.1% is roughly 3.5% of the overall wavelength that we were looking for. Because the known value fell within our range, we have no evidence that the known value is inaccurate. However, we want to find a more precise value for our wavelength. 0.1 centimeters is a large deviation. If you go back to the analogy of the radio wavelengths in your car stereo, this 3% can mean the difference between pop and country or whatever other station. Large deviations such as this are not good when dealing with electromagnetic radiation, as their applicability depends on the preciseness of knowing the wavelength of that radiation. The experiment was not over with just this standing wave. In seek of a more precise value for the wavelength of this microwave, we're going to present alternative methods of measuring wavelength. My partner Calvin Baver will present the alternative method we used to find this wavelength in part two of this presentation. He will present further conclusions to this experiment and refer back to this presentation. I want to thank you for giving your time to watch this presentation. I hope that it was of benefit to you. So Logan kind of went over basically the basics of the standing wave and a bunch of different other parts of the part of the experiment. So now what I'm going to kind of go over, I'm going to do a little review of the standing waves theory, and then I'm actually going to introduce the Floyd's mirror theory and as well as our experiment, our conclusion, and all that other stuff. So right now with the standing waves theory, I just put up an image basically saying you have a mode one at the top, mode two underneath that, node three, and then node four after that. And then kind of as Logan showed, we get to the calculations right here. You get the standing wave calculation is the delta L is equal to delta M lambda two. I know you use delta R, just that delta L fits with the actual image that I have up here. And then through actually rearranging that here, we get that the lambda is equal to two delta L delta N. And this is what we're kind of going to use the standing waves theory to basically get a good basis for how our Louis Tamir and see if the wavelength actually match and see if Lloyd's mirror is an actual method of getting wavelength. So now with the Lloyd's mirror experiment, it's gonna be set up kind of like the image above where you have A is going to be the transmitter, C is gonna be the receiver, and B is gonna be the reflector, S is going to be the path length, and then 2X is gonna be the length from A to C. And what we know about constructive interference is that when you get two waves that match in phase, they actually create a sort of maximum. So at the C, you're gonna see a maximum if they're in phase. In order to get them in phase, the distance from A to C has to be added by a multiple of the actual wavelength of the microwave. So from that idea of constructive interference, we can draw up the formula where the path length is equal to the multiple uh, of that wavelength plus the 2x. And this basically shows when constructive interference happens. And M is just going to be a mode from 0, 1, 2, 3. So say, for instance, I had a mode of 0. Obviously, that means that your path length is going to be exactly the same as that 2x, and that B, the reflector, is actually going to be right on that A to C line. And here we can kind of see when the path length will give us a constructive interference. And at looking at this, we were kind of trying to see how we could use this in our experiment to find wavelength for Floyd's mirror. And while looking at the formula, we noticed that it fits a line of regression formula. So that is going to be the y is equal to ax plus b, where a is the slope, b is the y-intercept. And you can see that the S is going to be our Y value. Our lambda is going to be the slope, that A value of this line. Our mode is actually going to be the X value. And then the 2X, the distance between A and C, is going to be our Y intercept. And we're going to use this in our experimental, as I'll talk later, 
to kind of find out the wavelength of using Lewis mirror. Some uh, useful equations added onto that is um, when measuring this, it was kind of hard to do the path length. It would actually do an increased uncertainty value by the factor of two if we use the path length. So we actually use y. So a kind of useful calculation is that path length is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared, where in the experiment x is going to stay the same, but we're changing y. So we can get that conversion. Another thing I added in here was solving for the uncertainty, where the uncertainty of lambda is equal to two times the square root of the uncertainty of y squared plus the uncertainty of x squared. Since we're kind of using the same measurement tools for the x and y value, those uncertainties will actually be exactly the same. So now into the actual experimental procedure. Right here is when we did the standing wave. And as you can see, as Logan talked about, the transmitter and receiver are 180 degrees apart from each other. And what we're going to kind of do is we want to start out a moment. So you're going to start a few distance apart the, between the transmitter and the receiver. And once you reach a maximum, that's going to be your first node that you're looking at. And then you're going to move that receiver back a little bit to the next maximum. And since we went from one maximum to the next, it's actually going to be delta n, the change in mode of one, which means that the denominator basically goes to one, which is actually very useful. So now all we need to do is measure the change in L how much we change the distance from the receiver from that first node to the second node, and that will give us the wavelength, which will actually be very useful. And then now into the experiment of the Lloyd Smear experiment. It is a little bit more complicated. As you can see, it still has the receiver and the transmitter on that 180 degrees parallel line, but now we also have a reflector, which is going to basically be on the perpendicular of that parallel line. However, the plate, the reflector, is going to be facing the parallel part of it. And so first you want to start at a mode is equal to zero because here we can't, like the standing wave, start at any mode. We need to know what the mode is because that's going to be our x value. So you start at a mode of zero, which is when that path length is equal to x. And so at that point, your y is going to be equal to zero. And then you move it a little bit back until you reach the next maximum on the receiver. And that is going to be your first mode. And then you record the y. And as you can see through here, that's kind of what we do. You start at that V1 reflector, which is First, you're going to start at m is equal to zero, and you're going to move it to that v2, which is when that next maximum happens, when the next constructive interference occurs. And then you're just going to record this in the data table that I have right here, and that's where the x is going to stay constant here because we're not really changing that. m is going to be your mode, which so we started with a mode of zero, then one, two, three, four, kind of go as far as you can. We really got up to five in our experiment, and then your y, which is going to be that distance from the center, a parallel line to the actual reflector, and then S is that path length. And obviously, we're not measuring path length here, so we use that X column and that Y column to actually calculate the S. And then what you want to do is you want to plot that M versus S, where M is on the horizontal uh, axis and S is going to be on that vertical axis. Use a line of best fit. We use Excel for this and find out the slope. Now into our actual experiment here. Well, doing this uh, through the standing wave method, we actually got a lambda of 2.8 centimeters, which is actually extremely well, uh, because we looked at the pamphlet that uh, our microwave transmitter and receiver came in, and they actually got a lambda of 2.84 when doing it. So we knew that our equipment was working right, and that we have now a good basis for what lambda is. So now to the Lloyd's mirror data. So this is us through several uh, modes here. And what you can notice is that at that X is we did both x is equal to 30 and x is equal to 40. We did two different things, and I'll talk more about that later, especially in the conclusion. And we just really wanted more concrete data. But anyways, you have the mode and the y distance that it was away from, that the reflector was away from that center point. And then we got the line of best fit here, and you can actually see that the r squared values are really nice, actually, for both of them, basically one with that 0.99 at the beginning. So we know that this is a good fit for the data. So then looking at the slopes here and using the uncertainty of lambda as I showed previously, with an uncertainty in y of 0.1 and an uncertainty in x of 0.1, we got that for the 30 centimeters, our lambda was equal to 2.51 plus or minus 0.28 centimeters, which doesn't include the 2.8 actually in that uncertainty level, but it is very, very close to the upper bound. So that's why we then did the 40 centimeters and we got a lambda of equal to 2.68 plus or minus 0.28 centimeters, which showed actually the 2.8 was way in that uncertainty value. And we now know that this can somewhat be derived as an accurate way to measure the wavelength.
And another way is something that we kind of just did on the side. As you remember, the equation is s is equal to m lambda 2x. So that y-intercept is actually going to be the 2x. So we just did a little thing where we looked at the y-intercept and we just solved for x. And as you can see, when we did it for the 30 centimeters, we got 30.5 centimeters. And when we did it for the 40 centimeters, we got 40.5 centimeters. And as you can see, those are very close, which once again shows that this is an accurate way to use Lloyd's mirror to find not only the wavelength, but the distance from the receiver to the transmitter. Kind of an overall conclusion here is we do, were able to use the Lloyd's mirror effect to accurately describe the wavelength. Our best data point was the 2.68 plus or minus the 0.28 centimeters while using the microwave with a wavelength of 2.8 centimeters, which actually shows that we were accurately able to do it and the data. Some of the things that we might approve through this thing is the lab setup. Think about microwave, and I think Logan touched a little bit on this, and that's why the double slit doesn't work, is that the microwaves are have a pretty large wavelength, so they reflect off a lot of things. So in our lab, the desks were kind of cluttered, so if we were to change this, we'd probably make a less cluttered desk, basically nothing around it, so that the microwave really only reflects off of that plate that we are using, which would actually help us to enhance our data. Another thing was our equipment, the transmitter and detector were a little bit finicky. Every now and then the detector would shoot up and shoot back down, so it actually took us a while to actually get the data points to make sure that they were correct. And then the actual measuring devices, the rulers, they were all finicky. They didn't align at the center points. And shifting back that reflector back and forth was actually a little bit of a hassle. And that's where some of our uncertainty really came from. So I feel like if we improved on those two things, we get a way smaller uncertainty and actually very close to that 2.8 centimeters. For now, of course, you can find the wavelength using the standing rule. We didn't show Lloyd's mirror basically to say that this is a new way to find the wavelength. Well, we use it because standing waves are kind of useful, but Lloyd's mirror effect actually shows a lot of use in uh, the practicality of the real world. So I looked at this uh, article, which is Lloyd's mirror's effect in fin whale calls and in use to infer depth of vocalizing animals. And this, I just pulled a photo from uh, the research paper, and it basically talks, they use the Lloyd's mirror effect to find at what certain depths some marine animals that use acoustic, acoustic calling are found at, and at what certain depths they do a certain call. And that was, they went through a lot of derivations, a lot of things, used Lloyd's mirror effect, and they came out to not only a correct answer of what depth they actually called, because they checked it with the observational and their calcul calculated answer, and they actually matched up very well. But they also were able to describe how whales, due to this Lloyd's mirror effect, are actually ran over a lot by uh, other ships, because it, you just don't see them on the radar because of the bouncing off of the ocean and with the radar and all that. So it was useful not only finding depths, but also kind of getting more under how we don't see whales on the radar and we actually sometimes end up running over them. And then here's going to be my bibliography on all that. And thank you guys so much for listening. That was uh, me and Logan's experiment on the Lloyd's mirror effect with microwave radiation.